Hello once again, it's Joe the CRM chap here with a new video in my series all focused on Microsoft Exam MB400. This is the developer's exam for those who are extending out either Dynamics 365 online or the Power Platform. So in today's video we're going to be taking a look at plugins. Now plugins are quite a sort of code heavy topic. Um, plugins give you the capability of, of executing potentially quite complex business logic uh, that you write out using a class library in either C Sharp or Visual Basic.net. So we're going to split things out in the purpose of this video will be to show you how to actually write a, and build your plugin in Visual Studio. In future videos in the series, uh, we'll look into how we can then deploy that out into the application, how we can do debugging, other topics like that today. So just want to keep this video fairly short. So if you've been following the series so far, you'll be familiar with our little solution on here. We've got MB400 app over here. And the, the requirement that we want to try and meet today is that, is that, is that we want to, want to have it so that our contact data is coming in in a bit more of a tidy state at the moment. So for example, if I was to create a brand new contact in here at the moment, I could just write in, you know, any rubbish like this, you know, make it all sort of horrible, you know, uppercase like that and stuff like that. It just looks really horrible and stuff like that. So what we want to do, we want to have a plugin that takes the first name and last name values that users input into the system and just sort of converts them into a very sort of nice title case. So in the case of John Smith, for example, that will go in as a capital J and a capital S if we were to input it in. So in order to start building like this plugin, we need to we need to come away from the application. We need to actually go into Visual Studio. Um, so in this particular case, we're going to be using Visual Studio 2019. Uh, you can use pretty much any version. I probably recommend that you try and use uh, Visual Studio 2017 or 2019 these days. Uh, we're just going to go continue without code for the second, just to open up the main window over here. We'll just give that a hide over there, and then we're going to go to the top up here. We're going to do new project first of all and the one that we're interested in has been selected on there as a, as a recent one but typically what you might need to do is just type in class library and you need to make sure it's a .NET framework and now you can write it in Visual Basic .NET if you want to um, if that is your preferred language it is supported I'm not going to sort of uh, t tell you not to do that but typically in most cases you would write your plugins using C Sharp it's a more common language people know it a lot better uh, compared with Visual Basic .NET so with that being the case then, we just need to find our uh, class library for C Sharp. Uh, just do a bit more of a search. Uh, it's not on the list down there, probably because it's up there, so we'll just click on that there. Okay, so we'll just uh, give this a name for now. We'll call this MB400 uh, demo, demo plugin. I'll just save this onto the desktop. Uh, just create a new folder. that select the folder on there now we need to make sure that we've got um, a specific version of .NET framework selected in this case we're going to use uh, 4.6.1 uh, for this one um, so that should work all fine so at this point I'm just going to click create down there and straight away we get our solution ready to go we just get a very an empty class project that's ready for us to basically start working with um, so if I just pin that there like so um, so yeah just a single class project on there uh, nothing too much to shout about at this particular point but there are some stuff that we need to do before we can actually start writing our code first of all we need to make sure that we have set up a strong name key file for the project and that we've configured uh, assembly signing it is a requirement for any custom DLL going into the application it must be signed so to do this we go to properties at the top up here uh, we go to signing down here we tip the little box down here and typically you may have an existing one in most cases just create a brand new one um, we're not going to protect this with a password um, don't generally do that anyway because uh, it can cause some complications down the road if you're not careful so we'll just call this uh, demo plugin uh, click OK, save that, and we can see we've got a strong name key file in our project, and that's now been signed using that. So that's all good to go from a deployment standpoint. Next, we need to get in the various SDK assemblies that we need that give us the op give us the various bits that we need to start building out our plugin. These days, you would use NuGet to get that. So what we would do is go to Manage NuGet Packages over here. 
click on browse and we're going to search for microsoft.crm sdk give that a search on there and we're looking for our core assemblies here this one's always pretty much mandatory uh, there are other assemblies which we um, some of which we'll look, dive into a little bit later on when we're um, when we're sort of doing things a bit later on and I've just realized we've got a incompatible version on the .NET framework on there so I think we can change this actually to 4.7.2 uh, yep so that's fine just let that save for a second uh, we will go back to NuGet and let's add back in our core assemblies that should hopefully install just fine now. Okay, looks like we're good. So we can see when we expand this up here in the references on here, we should see we've got a few new ones there. Microsoft XRM.SDK, Microsoft.CRM.SDK.Proxy. Uh, I think there's, that's the only two that, that one installs. Uh, but that's everything we're going to need to start building out the plugin. Okay, so now we can jump into the class down here. Um, we're just going to rename this to something a bit more useful, so we'll just call this M400, MB400 sample. Uh, we're going to click less to this so it, makes, so it makes sure it renames things out as we want them to. Now we can start getting the uh, appropriate modules added on that we're going to be using. So we can get rid of pretty much everything apart from using system up here. We're going to add in using system.globalization like so. Uh, and then we're also going to add a new using statement to the core SDK uh, assembly. Like so, oh, all thumbs today. Okay. So with that all good to go now, uh, we need to specifically declare our class as a specific type of interface. In this case, it's an iPlugin interface that we want to specify it as. So IntelliSense, because we've added on the assembly up there, gives us what we need. We can just double click on that, like so. That adds that in. We do get a squiggly line at this point. If we hit control and period, we get a recommendation down there to basically implement the interface, which we want to sort of accept. So if we do that, uh, we see that things go there and that's all ready to go. Um, so it is, as I say, at this point it's ready to go, but it's not gonna do anything. If we deploy this out, it's just gonna throw that exception on there and the user's just gonna get horrible errors, which we don't particularly want. So now we need to start building out the logic for the particular, um, for what we want to do here. So first of all, we need to actually get a reference to the context. So the context describes what's been going on as part of the particular operation that's triggering the plugin. So that would be details such as the record, its name, um, you know, what stage it's being executed, all sorts of really useful data. And from that, we can get information about the record that we're most interested in, in this case, our contact record. So we do this by declaring a, an iPlugin execution context, like so. Let's give it a name, context. Um, we make sure that it's always uh, converted into a plugin context and then we get this from our service provider. So service provider gets services and it'll be a type of iPlugin execution context, like so. So semicolon at the end of that. Next we do a check because we want to make sure that what we've actually got context-wise is an entity, a record that we can work with. So we do this by checking into our input parameters. And in this case, it'll be our target that will have this information. So we just want to make sure that we've got a, a target with no input parameters. And then next, we just want to confirm that, okay, this is actually an entity record that we're working with, or is it something that we're not particularly very interested in? Most of this is pretty much, um, what we've written so far is pretty much sort of boilerplate code, code that you would always want to have in place. Uh, and then underneath here is where you start doing your core uh, operations down there. Uh, I've just realized we've got a, a typo on there. Oh, should we get service? So I'll save that. Okay, so now I've been here, once we've confirmed that we've got an entity and we've got our context and it is an entity, um, we can then cast this out to an entity object for us to work with. So we do this by typing entity contact. Uh, do the appropriate conversion there. And again, this will be, our target will be our entity object. Um, and we know this because of this little check that we've done up here. So we're all good from there. So now we want to work with the specific fields that we want to change as part of this operation. So this will be two fields, our first name and last name field. So these are stored as string values in the, in the database. Um, so we can get these out from here. 
Now there's a few different ways that you can get your attributes out in, into a particular, let's say, string or object. You can do something like this. Uh, this is perfectly valid, first name like so. The issue with this though is that if it's null, uh, you'll potentially get a bit of an error on it, um, which won't be too great. So typically what you would, um, the preferred way of doing it, the preferred way that I usually do it, is that we do get attribute value instead. Uh, it gives you a few nicer options around that to you know, handle your nulls correctly and make sure that you're not um, you know, getting errors where you don't necessarily need them. Um, so what we can do here, we can just do a little bit of cheating. Um, it's pretty much the same bit of code that we want to do for our uh, getting our last name. We just obviously change it around a little bit. Okay. Now, because we want to convert into a specific um, case, we need to declare a, a culture object, um, and then that lets us perform our title case conversion. So we do this by doing text info like this, um, this culture. And we declare this as a new culture info object, and uh, since I'm UK based, I just set this to English GB, and then just give it false after that, um, so that the user cannot override it. Okay. Now at this point, we can get into and actually, if we've got a value in those fields, make sure that we convert them into um, into into our um, title case. But first of all, we just want to make sure that they're actually they're not null. Uh, because we're using the get attribute value, uh, it means that we can do this just just like so. Um, Going to cheat a little bit on here. I did get shouted out by one of my developer colleagues for considering this the other day. I quite like this as shorthand, but typically when you're writing if statements in C sharp, uh, you would have your curly braces like this, and then you do your appropriate logic here. Uh, you know, do logic here is what you typically do. If you've just got one line that you're executing, then what you can look at doing is getting rid of this completely. You just hit return, it tabs automatically down there, pop in just your one line. So in this case, it will be contact uh, first name uh, equals culture uh, to title case, uh, first name to lower, uh, cast the first name to lower, the existing first name value to lower, just to make sure that um, it's not already got any caps in it. Uh, oh, I just realized file name. That's completely wrong. If there should be first name. There we go. Okay, so yeah, so this is potentially um, a shorthand way of being able to do that. Uh, what's wrong with that? Ah, capital T should be. But what I've written just here, you can also express it uh, like this if you so choose. Both are valid options. So again, just like a lot of this stuff, just be, be consistent if you are using it. Um, you know, don't be mixing and matching. Consistency is always better than um, than non-consistency. Okay, so we've done the first name. So again, we can just do a little bit of cheating on here. We can just go down to here, copy and paste that in. Rename that to last name, like so, and then like so down here. Could do a find and replace, but I'm being a little bit lazy here. Uh, okay. And with that then, we've got our plugin class ready to go we can just give it a quick build up here and then this will be good to go so in the next video what we'll do we'll, we'll take this we'll get this deployed out into the application using a tool called the plugin registration tool and then we'll test it to make sure it all works but hopefully this video has given you um, some insight and some help in terms of how you can go about setting up your plugin project for the first time as I say it's relatively straightforward to do there is some there's a set order of things that you get used to doing each time as part of it. So once you do it a few times, you should feel fairly comfortable um, to go in and create any manner of plugins that you want to in the future. Okay, so I hope this video has been useful. Uh, please like and subscribe to the, like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, I try and do videos quite regularly on not just this exam, but also other subjects as well. Um, okay, brilliant. Thank you. Take care.